Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt. Thank you so much for joining me on today's video. I hope you're having a good one. We're talking about aircraft carriers today, the most prominent and dominant surface fighting vessel out there today on the fleet of the Seven Seas. And we have to remember that aircraft carriers for the most part are domineering in the world of the United States, being the biggest aircraft carrier fleet of the world. But why is it that we always talk about aircraft carriers of the United States and not other nations? Well, it's really unfortunate uh, that we can't focus on other aircraft carriers of the world because unfortunately not many of them exist. Yes, that is specifically that of the Russian military and the Russian Navy in having the reluctance to actually produce or, you know, begin designing at least uh, new aircraft carriers for the Russian Navy. And that's quite common nowadays. Uh, for the fact that the Russians have not really designed anything that is truly coming off paper into an actual physical design or construction for a very, very long time. Now, this reluctance to risk construction of big new warships is something of a trend in the Kremlin. During the Cold War, the Russian Navy deployed light aircraft carriers, huge nuclear-powered battlecruisers, and other large warships. But Russian shipyards never really recovered from the post-Soviet Union collapse. Some big old ships, such as the Kutsunov, which I did do a video on if you want to go check out, do remain in service to this day, but new construction focuses almost entirely on smaller, simpler service ships such as frigates, corvettes, and of course, submarines. But when it comes to aircraft carrier design, we are not talking about something as simple as smaller ships like this. Aircraft carriers are uniquely very, very complicated vessels to produce, and consider the myriad of other concepts for new aircraft carriers that are out there today. The Americans with the go bigger or go home style mentality, the Brits with their new two tower and still jump jet uh, ramp style uh, design for their F-35s, but the Russians themselves have pitched a huge 90,000 ton carrier design idea, focused specifically on that word idea and concept, it's not an actual design, known as the Lamantin, that would be able to embark as many as 60 aircraft, roughly double what that of the 60,000 ton Kutsunov can handle. But the government has yet to commit to a lengthy, expensive procurement program for the new carriers. And the big question is why? Why is it that Russia is not producing new aircraft carriers of today? Instead, it's pouring hundreds of million dollars into repairing, modernizing, and extending the useful life of the 1980s vintage Kutsunov, which despite the vessel's recent troubles, it's still going today, which is mind-boggling to me, an aircraft carrier of that size from the 1980s still going as it needs to. At the moment, the aircraft carrier is quite troubled. Being that it is a ski jump carrier, it displaces a rather large 60,000 tons and can theoretically make 30 knots and carry a combination of 40 or so helicopters and jet fighters. She was commissioned in 1990 and her sister remained incomplete as a Hulk for many years until it was purchased by China. In addition to helicopters, she also operates the MiG-29K and Su-33 fighter bombers. Like previous Russian carriers, Kutsunov supports a heavy missile armament than most Western ships, i.e. she can put some punch down if she needs to, unlike some of the Nimitz-class style or Gerald R. Ford-class ships. Unfortunately, hiccups with this ship also made it very difficult for Russia's naval aviators to remain practiced and effective in keeping ships like this being designed and procured. The ship has suffered multiple breakdowns over its career, including significant issues with its engines and recovering aircraft. And the fact that the ship is being, for the most part, limped across the seas, and nothing really has changed in the need for aircraft carriers, Russia has somewhat accepted the fact that, hey, look, we got an aircraft carrier that is pretty old, very old, it does what it needs to do, we haven't really needed to capitalize or utilize on it much, why on earth would we produce five or six more of these upgraded, more superly expensive ships when we may just not need them. Now, many of these difficulties in creating aircraft carriers for Russia came as a consequence of the dramatic decline of the maintenance funding at the end of the Cold War. But some of that was inevitable in the result of inexperience with this platform type. Russia is not the subject matter expert when it comes to designing aircraft carriers compared to that of the United States, and that's just a fact. Admiral Kutsunov engaged in several prestige cruises, but its most notable service came in 2016 off the coast of Syria. After a much publicized journey to the Mediterranean, she conducted combat operations in two months. The operations had more of a publicity impact than real military effect, and she actually lost two aircraft, one MiG-29 and Su-33, to accidents. The carrier currently is still being worked on for refit today. To support the aircraft carrier, Russia attempted to purchase a pair of French assault aircraft carriers, 
but the conquest and annexation of Crimea forced France to cancel this sale. These ships would have served as amphibious platforms with anti-submarine capabilities, but also would have given the Russian Navy experience with relatively large and new technologically advanced vessels to potentially concept design their own newer, more capable aircraft carriers. Indeed, part of the deal would have allow Russian construction of two Mistrals to the French specifications in its own yards, which would have provided a major boom to Russian shipbuilding industry. Now, Russia has a unique maritime geography, of course, with four fleets operating from four coasts practically incapable of offering mutual support. During the Soviet period, carriers supported the fleet of nuclear ballistic missile submarines, offering air and anti-submarine warfare protection for the bastions of which its subs patrolled. The missions allowed the carriers to de-emphasize strike capabilities, which is what the US has favored so heavily on, utilizing strike aircraft, the F-18, uh, anti-submarine warfare helicopters, etc. that can send in strike packages very quickly and effectively from coastlines around the world. Russia, not so much. The Kutsunov primarily is a vehicle for influence and prestige, however. It's really there to look as more of a deterrent, not as an active strike package that you're using in the manifestation of true naval power. In the future of Russian naval forces, it may focus more on developing its strike capabilities in order to project their power further. As of right now, though, no true concepts or designs have been put on the table other than the 90,000 ton ship I previously mentioned. But the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991 that it abruptly halted the carrier design program was just one problem. The other was logistics. The Krylov Design Agency in Russia, but the Soviet Union's main carrier design building shipyard was in the Black Sea in Ukraine, which became obviously an independent country that year. Ukraine scrapped the big carrier under the construction in 1998 and sold half the completed Varyag to China. Beijing spent 13 years finishing and upgrading the ship to turn it into China's first ever flat top. The rechristened ship now conducts sea trials today to help the Chinese Navy prepare for future home-built design carriers and to train the cadre of naval aviators, which is something which they've been trying to do for quite some time and is really, I think, where Russia is leaning towards is, hey, look, we've given you the bare-bone skeleton and a carrier for you to play with, get your skills up, do a little bit of engineering design, cross-reference, so speak, reverse engineer, which we clearly know the Chinese are very good at, and see what you can come up with. And if you come up with something better, hey, we'll just work with you and buy it from you. And that could be the way Russia's going. But Russian defense planners often announce projects as a means of gaining resources and prestige, rather than as part of a plan to develop or build anything in particular. At one point, President Dmitry Medvedev suggested that Russia would build and operate six aircraft carriers by 2025. Obviously, though, that's not going to happen. But there is an existing plan also for Project 23000E Storm Carrier, which is a 100,000 ton nuclear powered supercarrier employing EMALS catapults and a variety of other modern technologies. The carrier would presumably fly the MiG 29K fighters, although the age of the aircraft would suggest the need for a complete new replacement. The ability of Russia to build this ship under current circumstances, however, is in deep question. The aviation capability of the Russian Navy is also dangling by a bit of a thread. Being that Kusnov is old and in poor carrier condition, it's not even close to being laid down as a ship that should even host jets, and the jets themselves are being impacted by this. The Russian surface fleet has not received a great deal of attention in the latest military modernization plans either, and the Russian shipbuilding industry has not constructed a warship of the size of sophistication since Kusnov. That said, the Kremlin seems to view aircraft carriers as an important contributor to national prestige. The Russian Navy took great pains to get Kutsunov into position and support operations in Syria, and despite the embarrassment associated with it, it still has now pushed the carrier into a pretty good major refit. If the Kremlin determines that it needs a carrier to keep pace with France, Britain, China, and India, it really needs to begin seriously considering how to build or acquire such a ship. It's not inconceivable, however, that Moscow may consider ordering these carriers from Chinese shipbuilding yards. However, profound reversal that may seem, it is a reality. Otherwise, Russia really needs to start solidifying its construction timeline soon, or at least proposing a design that someone else can build for them. It's really interesting to know that Russia has not really formulated a plan so much on their naval carrier fleet, because as I said before, it's not their priority. Ground forces... Uh, you know, these ballistic missiles they're now designing, these hypersonic speed missiles are carrier killers. And they're designing weapons that can take out carriers before they even make it to strike group uh, locations. 
or areas of which, uh, you know, Western carrier groups can actually do what they've been intended to do. You can only launch jets so far. They need refueling, etc. And, you know, an aircraft carrier isn't a game changer in the entire global naval capabilities. It's a huge asset, but it's not, you know, it can't do everything. And the Russians know this. They know that, you know, yes, the aircraft carriers are a profound asset to have, but if I have something that can take it out before it even gets to me, why would I waste money building them? Aircraft carriers are extremely expensive. A couple of missiles that knocks them out, although probably expensive, are nowhere near as expensive as designing a full carrier. And this is the thing that I think Russia is primarily aiming their mentality towards. And this is purely opinions, folks, and, and not for reference. It's just an idea or a conceptual idea that I had is... Why would they build and produce aircraft carriers of such magnitude of which other countries are producing them when they can rely upon Chinese aviation or support if necessary as allies or just produce weapons that prevent aircraft carriers even getting close to strike patterns or groups that they're going to use? Really interesting, uh, really interesting doctrine in the way they're doing things. It is sad to see Kusinov, you know, patched to death. You know, she's still sailing to this day. I've actually, if I was, you know, part of the Russian... Uh, Navy, I'd be pretty proud to know that aircrafts are still launching off this ship's flight deck and it's still today doing what it needs to do. But I truly don't think that this is on their top Santa's wish list uh, for you know military procurement or acquired uh, assets that they need because it's just not on their urgency list. You know, ground forces, surface-based uh, corvettes, frigates, destroyers are more prominent for them because they want to be able to locate submarines, which is not something that, you know, hypersonic missiles can take out. Submarines are a threat, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, we talk about the battle cruiser uh, that's out there from Russia as well that can do quite a bit of damage with its own either strategic or tactical capabilities. So, submarines are a little bit more difficult, though. And, you know, aircraft carriers can't really... They can, but they can't truly hunt down submarines as effectively as destroyers, corvettes, frigates, and the like. And that's really where the Russian Navy is pumping its money into and instead of these gigantic aircraft carriers that the rest of the world is building. But each to their own, right? Each to their own doctrine and, and capabilities that they want. Uh, with the British uh, F-35 accident that happened recently, it was quite upsetting to see that uh, an F-35 had come off the deck of uh, one of the aircraft carriers there. But hey, things happen. Folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and uh, I'd love to hear your opinion on this uh, particular topic. What do you think? Why do you think that you know Russia's not pushing that resource or that time, money, and effort into aircraft carriers? Do you think it is truly just down to money, or it's more of a strategic decision to say, you know what, we just don't need them, we just don't want them? Uh, it's been a long time that they've not needed them, and not much has changed. Um, you think about the amount of assets the United States has in aircraft carriers, how much money it takes to keep them going. It's substantial, so maybe they're putting their, you know, purse strings somewhere else. Thank you again for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed. Please leave me a like and share this video if you did enjoy. And also, you can also click the little button uh, by the subscribe button to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future. For those of you who've been supporting my Patreon and PayPal, thank you so much for financially helping me and my channel. It really does mean a lot to me. So thank you all truly from the bottom of my heart. It really, really does mean a lot and I appreciate each and every one of you. If you do want to check out those links, you can go into the description box below of this video to see the links for those uh, particular sites. Thank you again and I hope you have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.